As the Mandalorian, Pedro Pascal's portrayal of Din Djarin has undoubtedly captivated audiences, and this series has become quite a hit among Star Wars fans. Born on Ock Vatina, Djarin had quite a traumatic childhood, as he was orphaned during the Clone Wars and then rescued by the Death Watch. He went on to wield the legendary Darksaber and also joined the cult known as the Tribe before he was eventually exiled and labeled as an apostate. He did finally find his way back to the Tribe, and Djarin is quite an exciting character character with numerous story arcs. Jon Favreau sought inspiration from Clint Eastwood's role as the man with no name to shape Din Djarin's character, and today we will explore the backstory of this brave Mandalorian warrior. Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Exploring the early life and backstory of Din Djarin. Born on the planet of Akvatina, Djarin faced a lot of trouble when Separatist droids attacked his village during the events of the Clone Wars. His entire family was caught in the attack, and the droids were killing anyone in their way. Djarin's parents hid him under a hatch to protect him, but they could not save themselves from an explosion. After his parents died, a B-2 series battle droid tried to kill Djarin as well, but a Mandalorian warrior working with the Death Watch spotted him in time. The warrior got got rid of the battle droid and rescued Jarrett. The Mandalorians then took him in as a foundling, which was a term used to describe any children who were adopted by Mandalorian warriors. Jaren was then raised on Concordia, where he trained alongside the Fighting Corps. Jaren himself joined the Death Watch after growing up and came across Bo-Katan Kryze before she eventually left the group. Around the events of the Great Purge of Mandalore, Jaren had officially become a part of the tribe, a Mandalorian clan who followed the archaic way of the Mandalore. The way was essentially a practice that forbade the clan members from removing their helmets, and Jaren was unaware that the tribe was a part of the Children of the Watch cult that enforced the way. He soon received his helmet, put it on, and even settled on Navarro. Once Jaren got his Mandalorian armor and put on his helmet, he kept it on and followed the way, as he would not be allowed to put the helmet back on if he ever removed it in the first place. During the fall of the Galactic Empire, Jaren worked as a bounty hunter, and he had even become famous as the Mandalorian or the Mando. He also traveled in a gunship known as the Razor Crest, and Jaren later became a part of the Bounty Hunters Guild during the rise of the New Republic. He soon started charging more fees for his bounties, and even gained a reputation as one of the most accomplished bounty hunters in the galaxy. He also worked with criminals such as Ranzar Melk and mercenaries such as Zeon and Kin, but his actions eventually divided the group and led to Kin's capture. His story arc in the Mandalorian series explored. The Mandalorian Season 1. Portrayed by Pedro Pascal, Din Djarin has appeared in all three seasons of the Mandalorian series, set five years after the incidents that took place during the Return of the Jedi. In the show's first episode, Jaren, aka the Mandalorian, accepted a job while working with the Bounty Hunters Guild. The Guild's leader, Grief Karka, commissioned Jaren to find a 50-year-old asset for a mysterious client. The asset was a remnant from the fallen Galactic Empire, and Jaren tracked it to the planet Arvala 7. He was also accompanied by an Ugnaught farmer named Quill, and he even ended up joining hands with the bounty hunter droid named IG-11 to track this asset. Jaren eventually learned that this asset was an infant known as the Child, and that he belonged to the same species as Yoda. As the story continued, Jaren was attacked by a huge mudhorn creature in Chapter 2, The Child. He almost died during this attack, but then the Child used the Force and saved him. In the next episode, the Mandalorian delivered the Child to the mysterious client on Navarro, but he later felt that he should get the child back. He once again traveled to the client's base to rescue the child, and he was later ambushed by the Bounty Hunter Guild's leader, Grief Karga. Karga was accompanied by other guild members, but Jaren somehow evaded them all and escaped from Navarro with some help from other Mandalorian warriors. As the story progressed, various bounty hunters tried to capture Jaren and the child, and they traveled to countless places to escape them. Over the next three episodes, Jaren and the child have several adventures where they travel to a 
Sorgan village and protect the local villagers from raiders, help capture the assassin Fennec Shand on the planet of Tatooine, and also work alongside Miggs Mayfield and Ran Malk's mercenaries to carry out a prison raid. In Chapter 7, The Reckoning, Grief Karga contacted Jaren and told him that the client's forces had overtaken their town. He asked the Mandalorian to help them, and even promised to cancel the bounty on his head if only he helped them to get rid of the client. Jaren also contacted several allies such as Queel, IG-11, as well as an ex-rebel shock trooper named Cara Dune. They traveled to Navarro to get rid of the client, but they were cornered by Moff Gideon and his entire Death Trooper team. Gideon had killed the client and even captured the Mandalorian allies, and he also knew everything about Jaren's past and the history of the other Mandalorians. In the season finale, the Mandalorian and his allies struggled to fight against Gideon and Queel was even killed during the fight. Jaren was also gravely injured and IG-11 even removed his helmet to look at his wounds. Eventually, the Mandalorian decided to ask his tribe for help in defeating Gideon, but he was shocked to learn that the Imperials had gotten rid of his covert. The Mandalorian eventually found the Armorer, who was the tribe's leader. The Armorer agreed to adopt the child into their culture as a foundling. Furthermore, the Armorer also tasked the Mandalorian with the duty of finding the child's family or other members of his species. She even told the Mandalorian that he was now like a father to the child, and IG-11 later sacrificed himself to help the Mandalorian and others escape Navarro. As this season ended, the Mandalorian faced Gideon one last time before finally escaping with the child. The Mandalorian Season 2 In the show's second season, the Mandalorian decided to search for other Mandalorians who might guide him toward the child's people and help him find a Jedi. In Chapter 9, the Marshal, Gore Koresh, told the Mandalorian about another Mandalorian who was living on the planet of Tatooine. Jaren and the child traveled to Tatooine, where they came across Cobb Vanth, the Marshal of Mos Pelgo. He was dressed in Mandalorian armor so that he could protect his people from any external threat, and the Mandalorian demanded that he remove the armor and give it to him. Vanth didn't want to give up the armor, and he eventually allied with the Mandalorian when a crate dragon attacked Mos Pelgo. The Mandalorian tells Vanth that he will help him slay the dragon if he returns the armor to him. After teaming up with a tribe of Tusken Raiders to kill the dragon, Vanth returned the Mandalorian armor to Jaren, and they went their separate ways. In the next chapter, titled Chapter 10, Passenger, the Mandalorian decided to go on a mission to take Frog Lady and her eggs to Trask. They started their journey on Tatooine, and the Mandalorian only accepted this mission because he was promised some leads on other Mandalorians. As they traveled to Trask, they were stopped by X-Wing pilots from the New Republic, who wanted to arrest the Mandalorian for his role in the prison raid. However, the Mandalorian ended up protecting these pilots from a swarm of strange insect creatures on Maldo Kreis, and they decided to clear him of any charges. Apparently, they had crash-landed on Maldo Kreese, and the Mandalorian then struggled to repair the Razor Crest to complete his mission somehow. In Chapter 11, The Heiress, the Mandalorian finally reaches Trask, where the Frog Lady's husband sends him to an inn where he learns that some Mandalorians were seen on the moon. A team of Quarrens even offered to accompany them, but they intend to kill the Mandalorian and the child so they could steal Jaren's armor. The Mandalorian and the child were rescued by a team of Mandalorians that were led by Bo-Katan Kreese. Kreese used to rule over Mandalore briefly before she lost the Darksaber to Moff Gideon, and the Mandalorian initially had a hard time trusting her. However, he decided to help her on a mission to retrieve some Mandalorian relics, as Kreese agreed to give him information about a Jedi in return. After their mission, Bo-Katan told the Mandalorian to travel to Corvus, where he would come across Ashoka Tano. In the next chapter, Chapter 12, The Siege, the Mandalorian met with Grief Karga and Cara Dune on Navarro. He even decided to help them raid the last Imperial base on Navarro in exchange for his ship's repair. While they attacked the Imperial base, they learned that they were experimenting with the child's blood for some cloning experiments, and that they were using this blood to create Force-sensitive clones. They destroyed the Imperial base, and the Mandalorian later tried to evade the Imperial forces as they tried to track them down. In the next episode, titled Chapter 13, The Jedi, the Mandalorian travels to Corvus with the child after his Razor Crest is repaired. As they arrive on Corvus, they are taken to the Imperial Magistrate of Caledon. Morgan Elsbeth.
Elsbeth tried to recruit the Mandalorian to kill Ashoka Tano, and he pretended to accept this offer so that he could finally find Ashoka. He met Ashoka, who then used the Force to communicate with the child. She learned that his name was Grogu, and that he was a Jedi youngling rescued during the Great Jedi Purge from the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Grogu kept his powers a secret to keep living, and Ashoka was hesitant to train him since he seemed pretty attached to the Mandalorian. Ashoka then asked for the Mandalorian's help in defeating Elsbeth and freeing the city of Kaladan. The Mandalorian agreed to help her. After liberating the city, Ashoka guided the Mandalorian to a Jedi temple on Tython and told him he would find a different Jedi there. In Chapter 14, The Tragedy, Jaren traveled to Tython with Grogu and took him to a Jedi temple. While Grogu meditated at the temple and tried to establish contact with another Jedi, Jaren faced Boba Fett and Fennec Shan. Boba Fett wanted to get his hands on the Mandalorian's armor, and Jaren was even willing to give up his armor to keep Grogu safe. However, things went out of hand when Moff Gideon's Imperial forces tracked him down by following the Razor Crest. While Fett and Shand finally helped Jaren keep Grogu safe, their attempt failed as Gideon's forces managed to capture Grogu. They even destroyed the Razor Crest, and the Mandalorian was at a loss for words. He finally decided to recruit allies to help rescue Grogu from Gideon, and he even approached Cara Dune and asked her to release Mayfield from a New Republic prison. In the next episode, titled Chapter 15, The Believer, Jaren and Mayfield went on a mission to infiltrate an Imperial refinery so that they could get a lead on Gideon's location. During this mission, the Mandalorian even removed his helmet to find the terminal with Gideon's coordinates, and their cover was soon blown when Mayfield killed an officer. Mayfield and Jaren somehow escaped on Boba Fett's ship, known as the Slave One, and Mayfield even aimed his sniper at the refinery and blew the place up as they left. Cara Dune even agreed to report that Mayfield died on this mission so that he could escape and not have to return to prison. As the episode comes to an end, Jaren sends a threatening message to Gideon and warns him that he will rescue Grogu. In Chapter 16, The Rescue, the Mandalorian finally declares a raid on Gideon's cruiser to rescue Grogu, and he also has a team of allies, including Bo-Katan as well as her team of Mandalorian warriors. Boba Fett also planned an assault on the stolen Imperial shuttle where Grogu was kept, and they managed to breach the ship's hangar. While the rest of the team decided to attack the ship's command bridge, the Mandalorian went to look for Grogu and even came across some of Gideon's dark troopers on the way. He defeated them and finally came across Gideon, who was holding Grogu. Gideon agreed to hand over Grogu only if he let him escape with the Darksaber. However, Gideon then tried to kill the Mandalorian, and the two of them engaged in a duel where Jaren defeated Gideon. After rightfully winning the Darksaber, the Mandalorian also rescued Grogu and returned to the command bridge. Bo-Katan and the rest of the allies were waiting for him, and they even told the Mandalorian that anyone who wins the Darksaber in combat becomes the ruler of Mandalore. Bo-Katan wanted the Darksaber, and she almost fought the Mandalorian when the Dark Troopers returned to attack them. However, the troopers were destroyed by none other than Luke Skywalker, and it turned out that Grogu had managed to establish contact with the Jedi while meditating on Tython. Luke suggests that he will take Grogu with him to train him as a Jedi, and the Mandalorian had difficulty bidding Grogu farewell. He even removed his helmet as Grogu left with Skywalker and watched him leave with tears in his eyes. <laughs> The Mandalorian's Adventures in the Book of Boba Fett television series. After bidding farewell to Grogu, Jaren had a hard time wielding the Darksaber, and his story arc during this period was covered in the spin off series titled The Book of Boba Fett. In this show, he first appeared in Chapter 5, Return of the Mandalorian, where he was seen working as a bounty hunter. He was still getting over Grogu's absence and was also struggling with the Darksaber. He went on a mission to kill the Clatoonian crime boss, Kaba Baez, and then took his head to an Ishil Tib guildmaster. The Guildmaster then gave him the location to the tribe's new secret base, and the Mandalorian then traveled there and reunited with the Armorer. He also met his old tribe member, Paz Vizsla, and he recapped his adventures to the Armorer. The Armorer also explained the Darksaber's history and trained him to use it properly. During his training, Vizsla challenged the Mandalorian to a duel to win the Darksaber, and the Mandalorian soon won the fight. However, he soon confessed that he broke the creed and went against the way by removing his helmet twice during his adventures. He was then labeled an apostate, and the Armorer expelled him from the tribe. She further told him that he could atone by bathing in the living waters in the mines of Mandalore, but these waters were seemingly destroyed during the Great Purge. She also allowed him to keep his armor and the Darksaber, and the Mandalorian then traveled to Tatooine and met with Peli Motto. Motto gave him a Naboo N1 Starfighter as his new vehicle. The Mandalorian later ran into Fennec Shand, 
who asked for his help in fighting a war alongside Boba Fett. He agreed to join their fight, but first decided to visit Grogu. In the next chapter, Jaren went to a forested planet where Grogu was training with Luke Skywalker. He also met Ashoka Tano once again, who told him that it would be unwise to meet Grogu and that he would end up hindering his training. The Mandalorian decided to return to Tatooine without meeting Grogu, but he did hand a gift to Ashoka and asked her to deliver it to Grogu. The gift was a Beskar chainmail made by the armorer, and Jaren left the gift with Ashoka and then traveled to Boba Fett's palace. He then traveled with his team to recruit more people to join their fight, and they traveled to Mos Pelgo to recruit Cobb Vanth. In Chapter 7, In the Name of Honor, Jaren reunited with Boba Fett and Shan, and they prepared to face the Pikes. Cad Bane showed up with Pike soldiers and revealed that he killed Cobb Vanth, and they finally ended up in a fight where the Mandalorian and Boba Fett's soldiers put up a great fight. Finally, Motto arrived at the scene with Grogu, who stated that he received the Mandalorian's gift and had decided to stop his Jedi training. Grogu wished to be with the Mandalorian, and he even saved Jaren's life when Fett's rancor went rabid and started attacking people. Grogu used the Force to put the creature to sleep, and he later left Tatooine along with the Mandalorian. The Mandalorian Season 3 The third season of The Mandalorian followed the events that took place in the Book of Boba Fett, and The Mandalorian had once again reunited with Grogu. In Chapter 17, The Apostate, The Mandalorian learns that the convert has relocated to a new location, and he then travels there with Grogu. However, the armorer once again insisted that The Mandalorian would be considered an apostate until he bathed in the living waters. The Mandalorian returned to Navarro with Grogu, as he hoped to repair the IG-11 droid and use his help to assess Mandalore's ruin. However, IG-11's memory core could not be repaired, and then he decided to find a new droid. He ended up clashing with Pirate King Gorian Shard's fleet on his way, and finally arrived on Kalivala with Grogu. He met Bo-Katan on Kalivala, and learned she had given up on all her plans to rule over Mandalore. Bo-Katan tells him about the mine's location and how to reach the living waters. In the next episode, titled Chapter 18, The Mines of Mandalore, the Mandalorian was still searching for a new memory core for the droid, and he asked Peli Motto for help on Tatooine. Motto didn't have a memory core, but he offered an R5-D4 instead. The Mandalorian decided to head to Mandalore with Grogu and R5-D4, and he was relieved to learn that the planet's atmosphere was breathable. They traveled under the surface of Sundari to find the mines, where a cyborg creature attacked the Mandalorian. While he was trapped, the Mandalorian asked Grogu to ask Bo-Katan for help, and Grogu then found and convinced her to come to Mandalore. Bo-Katan killed the cyborg creature with the Mandalorian's Darksaber, and even traveled to the mines of Mandalore. She did not believe any legends of the place, but she still went to the living waters with the Mandalorian. When the Mandalorian bathed in the living waters, he ended up drowning, and Bo-Katan then saved him and also spotted a mythosaur. In Chapter 19, The Convert, the Mandalorian returned to Calavar with Grogu and Bo-Katan, where they were attacked by Thai bombers. The bombers even destroyed Bo-Katan's castle, and the Mandalorian suggested they seek refuge at the Covert's new hideout. The Mandalorian had even carried a sample of the living waters to prove that he did bathe in them, and the armorer and the rest of the tribe soon declared that he had redeemed himself. Bo-Katan also acts as a witness, and the tribe allowed her to join them since she had also bathed in the living waters and not removed her helmet ever since they returned. In the next chapter, titled Chapter 20, the Foundling, the Mandalorian looked after Grogu as he started his training as a foundling, and he also went with Bo-Katan on a mission to rescue Paz Visla's son, Ragnar. In the next episode, titled Chapter 21, The Pirate, a New Republic captain named Carson Teva approaches the Covert and tells Jaren about how Shard's pirates had attacked Navarro. The Mandalorian tried to convince the Covert to liberate Navarro, and the Covert agreed to help Karga and the people of Navarro. After freeing Navarro, Karga gifted some land to the Covert and invited them to live among the townspeople. <laughs> What is Din Djarin like as an individual? Din Djarin is a formidable warrior who had defeated many opponents, but was also a lone wolf who preferred to work alone. He accepted others' help on many occasions and struck deals with them in exchange for something. Djarin was usually very quiet and didn't share any unnecessary information with anyone. This character is portrayed by Pedro Pascal in the television series, and he states that this character is quite human and accessible even if his face is covered with a helmet. Djarin comes across as a relatable character, and the audience is reminded of this whenever he removes his helmet.
Helmet, Pascal further stated that the Mandalorian is a morally ambiguous character who strives to do the right thing. Still, sometimes he dabbles in dark actions, especially while carrying out his missions as a bounty hunter. His warrior and bounty hunter sides sometimes create a conflict, and he could sometimes even come across as self-centered. He initially had a cold persona, and he even ignored the requests of his victims, but he eventually became very humane and developed more morals. Over time, the Mandalorian also stopped working alongside mercenaries such as Ran Melk, and he also showed a lot of humanity, especially after coming across the child. Grogu's presence moralizes the Mandalorian, and we get to see a new side of him, especially when he decides to go back and rescue the child after after handing him over to the client. Jaren was also very serious about Mandalorian traditions and culture, and he greatly respected them for adopting him into their culture after his parents' death. <laughs> Can Din Djarin potentially be a good leader for Mandalore? While Din Djarin currently holds the Darksaber that gives him the power to rule over Mandalore, fans wonder if he would be a good candidate for that position. On one hand, Djarin is a good leader with a sense of what is right or wrong for his people. He doesn't blindly ally with anyone or make decisions on a whim, but he weighs in multiple factors and comes across as a well-balanced individual. Djarin also does not expect people to blindly follow him just because he wields the Darksaber. He also has years of experience fighting as a Mandalorian warrior and a bounty hunter. His adventures have shaped him into a good leader, but Jaren also doesn't seem too keen to take over the position of the ruler of Mandalore. He had even tried to hand over the Darksaber to Bo-Katan after their fight with Gideon. One must also consider the fact that Jaren has only proved himself to be a good warrior, and that does not guarantee that he will also be a good leader. He also doesn't belong to Mandalorian culture by birth, which means he is unaware of many ancient Mandalorian traditions. He was raised as a child of the Watch, and he had accepted the way which prohibits him from removing his helmet and he also did not understand Bo-Katan's or other Mandalorians' perspective of the Children of the Watch. In this manner, he was not entirely well-versed in Mandalorian culture, and only time will tell if Jaren steps up to be a good leader. Will Din Djarin and Bo-Katan face off going forward in the Mandalorian series? While the Mandalorian series has predominantly focused on Jaren's story arc as he traveled with Grogu, Bo-Katan Kreese's character has been gaining much importance in the recent season. Initially, Bo-Katan also wanted to get her hands on the Darksaber, and she did accompany Jaren on several missions. From helping Jaren rescue Grogu from Moff Gideon to guiding him to the Living Waters, Bo-Katan has been a part of several essential story arcs. She has also been accepted into the Children of the Watch, and the Armorer allowed her to remove her helmet, which is something that Din Djarin was reprimanded for. She has also led the people of Mandalore in the past, and the Armorer even trusted Bo-Katan to unite Mandalore once again. While Djarin has a rightful claim to the Mandalorian throne by wielding the Darksaber, Bo-Katan has spotted the ancient Mythosaur creature, which was a symbol that the Mandalorian people would rise again in a new age. The Armorer believed that Bo-Katan would be responsible for ushering in this new age, since she spotted the Mythosaur, but Jaren has also been a constant driving force who has earned the trust of the Mandalorians. He also displayed his leadership skills when he played a role in resettling the Mandos on Navarro, and he is an honorable character who went to great lengths to redeem himself by bathing in the living waters after he removed his helmet. While Jaren has never claimed to be a leader, his actions have shaped him to take charge of Mandalore. Bo-Katan's history with Mandalorian culture and her experience with the Death Watch also makes her capable enough to lead Mandalore, and there is no correct answer as to which one of these two should step up to be the leader. While the two of them have worked as allies in the past, there's a good chance that they might be pitted against each other and even engage in combat to claim the Mandalorian throne. While Jaren has the Darksaber, Bo-Katan has the Blessing of the Armorer. According to Mandalorian culture, it is highly likely that these two warriors will decide by combat if Bo-Katan decides to claim this title and go up against Jaren to win the Darksaber. Furthermore, this raises the possibility that Jaren and Bo-Katan's face-off would give way to another Mandalorian civil war if the two decide to fight for the throne. What makes Din Djarin so dangerous? Din Djarin was a fierce warrior who once earned a reputation as one of the most dangerous bounty hunters in the galaxy. He had been trained alongside Mandalorian warriors and had an array of weapons and equipment that made him almost invulnerable. He had a set of Durasteel Mandalorian armor that covered him from head to toe, as well as a helmet that he always wore. His armor was also fitted with plated vests, pauldrons, two gauntlets, 
as well as boots, and he later got his hands on a jetpack as well. Jaren could also control this jetpack from afar, and his suit later got quite an upgrade. At this point, it was fitted with a pistol holder, a cape, as well as bandoliers that could be used to store ammunition. Jaren's helmet was also equipped with upgraded technology, and it could detect heat signatures, footprints, and even audio. His armor also had a whipcord launcher and a flamethrower and he even carried an IB-94 blaster pistol. This pistol was typically fitted into his belt, and Jaren also kept a vibro knife hidden in his boot. Jaren also had a collection of Mandalorian weapons and armor, but he typically didn't use them. He was usually seen with a vest, backpack, and helmet, as well as a Beskar spear that he got on Corvus. Eventually, Jaren went ahead and defeated Moff Gideon and earned the Darksaber. Jaren also had a powerful ride in the form of the Razor Crest, and this gunship was also equipped with numerous weapons, such as grenade launchers, a drum blaster, and a variety of rifles and pistols. When Jaren traveled to Tatooine, he was also seen using a Zephyr J speeder bike to move around the planet. Jaren was a fighter through and through, and he honed his fighting skills and even managed to defeat several extremely powerful opponents. Conclusion. Din Djarin is certainly one of the most exciting characters in the Star Wars universe, and he's gained quite a lot of fan following through the Mandalorian live-action series. He is destined for greatness, and he's even proven himself on numerous occasions. As for us, we cannot wait to see what's in store for Din Djarin in future story arcs. That's all for today, but if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, be safe out there, and have a marvelous day.